ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Rizzotto. What is going on, everybody, and welcome. My name is Steven Rizzotto. I cover the San Francisco Giants for SF Bay, and I'm the host of RizzoCast, the podcast that features current and former big league players, coaches, fans, media, and others who are regarded as some of the brightest minds around the game today. Today's guest is Anthony Garcia, a longtime sports producer at NBC Sports Bay Area and a new in-game ballpark host at Oracle Park, the home of the San Francisco Giants. He's also one of the four hosts on Summer Sunday, the Giants summer post-game show during the summer. Little disclaimer before we start, we went to the same high school, different times, but same high school. So we definitely share kind of a bond over that. And we discuss his new gig at the ballpark, connecting with Giants fans, ballpark proposals, his unique energy, Barry Bonds' Hall of Fame case, working on the post-game shows, the Giants crop of young stars, so much more. A lot of laughs in this episode. This is episode number 140, a milestone. And without a further ado, let's get started. All right, we are here with the one and only Anthony Garcia, and Anthony is kind enough to hop on RizzoCast. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Appreciate you coming on. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you, Stephen, a fellow Reardon alum. So I would do anything for my fellow Reardon alums. But thank you for having me on. You do such a great job. I see you posting. I see you with all your guests. And I'm not going to lie. There have been times where I thought, when is this dude going to invite me? When with Reardon, you know, see each other in the press box. I'm like, when is he going to? But he made it. 140. Episode 140. I finally made it. Thank you for having me on. That's right. Yeah. Episode 140. And I'm sorry that it took 140 people to get you on, but we are here now. And yeah, you dressed the elephant in the room. Before we get started, we have to address that we went to the set. We bond over going to the same high school. So Anthony shares an alma mater with me. Reardon High School in San Francisco. Great four years. Um, So we had to get that out of the way. We have a lot of pride for our high school. Right, Anthony? Absolutely, we do. Love Archbishop Reardon. I grab. I graduated a lot, many, many years before you. Uh, but we do have that bond. I love. I love Reardon. I try to sneak it in as many times as I can on Summer Sunday, um, and it pisses off Therese because her dad was a coach at Sarah, and there's always <laughs> like Mitch Haniger with the MIDI, and there's always like random like players who go to MIDI or they go to Sarah, or they go to St. Francis, and I just always. I like to I like to chide Teresa. I like to poke Teresa and make sure she knows that Archbishop Beard is the official WCAL high school of Summer Sunday. Good. Okay. I'm glad to hear that, to be honest. Yeah. I'm glad to it seems like every time like an opponent comes in the Oracle Park, there's always somebody either from like the peninsula or like Elk yeah. Grove. Elk Grove always has like one or two guys on their team. And it's like, God. California man hotspot and WCL hotspot for I mean there's guys coming through the WCL all the time so watch out for them <laughs> uh, um so this yeah, is your, it's yeah. crazy to me there's always like Logan Webb with the rock well, he's from Rockland or you know Brandon Crawford is you know from I forget where he's from somewhere in the East Bay um but yeah our, yesterday on summer Sunday we we're talking about Randy Johnson he's from Walnut Creek and it's mm-hmm. just it Bay Area man hotspot of baseball who knew yeah, absolutely. It's it's still building. Um, and this is your so let's get into it. Kind of this is your first season as in game ballpark host for the Giants. I mean, that's a pretty big title. I mean, when I saw this, I I automatically thought that when I saw that you had gotten the position, I thought that this is a perfect job for you. You know, your your top notch energy, high energy dude. How did getting this job kind of come about? Take me through it. Um. Uh, well, I I owe a lot in my professional life, and I mentioned her. Uh earlier is Therese Fignol, who has championed in me um, in many ways. And it's, you know, when you're trying to get a foot in the door through this business, um, you know, it's a cliche. Sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. And uh, Therese has gone out of her way many times to um, give me opportunities and to help open doors for me. And she uh, uh, she was the in-game host the last couple of years at Oracle Park. She's done it, I think, for like six or seven seasons. She's been there a while. Um, and they had a... Uh, they were looking for a, a second host and she reached out to me and said, Hey, I think that you would be great for this. And, 
you know, I, I applied, I auditioned, I interviewed, I, you know, I worked hard, man. I worked hard. It was not an easy, it was not an easy process. They put me through the ringer for sure. But, um, I was able, uh, I was able to get it. It was a lot of fun and I love working with everyone, um, down there, Amanda, Carl, everyone at uh, Giants Vision. It's a, it's a lot of fun, man. We're having a great time, but, uh, Therese was the one that, that helped, uh, that helped me out there. So um, I owe a, a lot to her. She's, she's great. So, and it's, it's been fun, man. I, I, I'm having fun. I, the mm. people who see me, it, uh, my friends and family tell me that they're having fun. I hope people who aren't my friends and family are having fun, but I do hear a couple uh chuckles every now and again uh, in the stadium when I make a joke or I try to make a pop culture reference. So uh, it, it's a good time, you know, and I was telling that I, I just feel like, you know, Oracle park, I think for a lot of people for giants fans, it's home in a weird way you know it's home and I think anytime you you go home or you go to a place that you're comfortable with or you go to a place that you love you want to have fun you want to be entertained you want it to be familiar and that's really my goal as an in-game host is, is to, to be welcoming um to be to be fun to be energetic to be entertaining um, you know just because the 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 team may be losing and not that they've been losing a lot, but just because the team might be losing in the sixth inning, that doesn't mean like, Hey, we can't throw out a couple of teams and have fun. I can make a couple of jokes. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you're getting your steps in too. Cause I see you're all over the ballpark during some of these bits. So like, do you ever check like your Fitbit or like your iPhone got to figure out how many steps you're getting in? I'm in the 10, 11, 12,000 step range. Okay. I'm working at the ballpark. Other days, I'm in like the four, five, six. So I always know when I go back and look at my app uh, what days I'm at the ballpark. But man, it was really funny. It was, I almost missed the hit. I almost missed the segment at the ballpark. <laughs> it was uh, a one half inning. We did a um, like a cookie eating contest. And it was in the, in like section 135. It was a section right next to the, um, the foul pole. And I had three outs to get back to the 415 to introduce DJ Umami. I don't know if you were there that day. And uh, I go up the stairs to go up to the concourse right before the mini ballpark. And I already see there's one out. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. So I kind of start moving a little quicker. Next pitch, two out. So I have one out and I just sprint. I sprinted as fast as I can from basically the Coke bottle to the cable car, down the steps into the 415. As I'm running down the steps, my crew who's sitting there is like they're wide-eyed and bug-eyed because I'm making it the final lot happens they hand me the mic right as I go on camera and I'm like <sighs> I'm panting I'm exhausted they cut to me they point to me that I'm on and I'm just like I, I just ran here ladies and gentlemen DJ with mommy and like <laughs> usually I try to make a joke I try to say something fun uh, but I was just, I couldn't even talk. I was like, all right, guys, here's DJ Omami. I can't talk. But that was, I almost missed it. I've yet to miss a hit ever. And I want to keep that streak going. But uh, maybe I need the Giants to take a couple of pitches. Um, I need to let them know. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when the pitcher bat, or I guess when the pitcher used to bat and the leadoff hitter would take a couple of pitches, you know, to let them rest a little bit. Yeah. I, I need to let them know when I got back to back hits, they can take a couple of pitches off for me. That's a great, that's a great story. And I wonder like if you didn't make it, they would have just like hand to like an empty, like an empty, it, maybe it was you running. Maybe they would have gotten a shot of you running <laughs> or just an empty slot there where the cable cars are, but that's pretty amazing. It would have, yeah. Or maybe, it, every, you know, there's a joke about live TV. Uh, what, if you, if it's what you see or what, or what you heard, it was, me, you, you were meant to see or hear it. You know, there's there's no redos. We can't do it again. So if you see it, that's what you get. And so I'm sure we would have rolled with the punches in some sort of way. But, um, you know, just working in live TV, I've worked at NBC Sports for 11, 12 years. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that moment, those moments where it's not perfect and it's not perfectly executed, sometimes it gives you a little room to to have fun with it. And those are sometimes the most memorable moments. And that was, uh, I remember just panting and just being exhausted <laughs> and being like, that. who cares? It's DJ Mommy. I'm tired. I need to catch my breath. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And kind of give, give me a look at like your routine at the ballpark. So what time do you get there? What are you doing pregame? Is there, mm-hmm. is, is the prep kind of rigorous for something like this or is it kind of just go with the flow? Well, we usually meet um, like a week beforehand. You know, it's very detailed. You know, they 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 run a really tight ship. They're very organized at, at the Giants. You know, we meet a week in advance. You know, we're looking at the upcoming teams, upcoming homestands, the giveaways, if it's a certain night, if it's Pixar night or Disney night or Pride night or Fiesta y Contest. You know, we like to have content that obviously Kentucky Derby Day that kind of um, caters to whatever day that is. 
Um, so, you know, it's weeks in advance and we all have a Google Doc and we're, you know, throwing ideas in there and, you know, but in terms of, of so by the time the day is there, you know, our producer, um, Amanda Suzuki, who is absolutely fantastic, um, by the time it's game day, she's already kind of plugged in place, you know, whatever she wants to do or we want to do that day. And so I usually get there about three hours before the game. Um, so like a 6.45 game, I'm there at 3.45. We start a meeting at about four. We go through every, sing every single thing that you see on that scoreboard, mm. whether it's the kiss cam or whether it's the sing-along song or any sponsor or any commercial, anything that we do, the T-shirt toss, or if we're playing a game, you know, um, uh, Giants math with the jersey numbers, or we're doing um, chocolate unicorn where you stack cookies on your forehead, mm. or we're doing a warning check race. Everything is to the T is to the second nothing that you see on that board happens by accident it is a production um to the t so we go through literally every single thing and then you know a lot of times i'm researching stats or researching things for um things i have to talk about if i'm we doing a highlight of last night's games i'm going through the plays and writing down notes and writing my script or um if we're doing a a pitching matchup I'm looking at the stats and seeing how that pitcher is doing how they fared against the Giants what they've done in the last couple of games so you know it's yeah I'm, we get a, I get there about three hours before the game and then we're, we're cranking it out man and then every and usually about 30 minutes to eat in the press dining room I know I've mm -hmm. seen you there a couple of times uh, we get a little something to eat and then it's on the field and then we're on the field about 45 minutes to an hour before the game and then we're doing the, the pregame is the big chunk of it and then we we do hits all up uh, until about, you know, right before Brunel takes over and does the starting lineups in the first pitch. And then during the game, I'm running around, man. I'm in section 135, you know, doing doing a thing where, you know, the fans are drawing Lucille on, uh, on a plate. And then I'm in section 221 with doing a lucky giveaway. And then I'm in section, you know, 105 doing a nut. So I'm running around, man. I'm getting my steps in. And usually I'll have about two or three innings to get to the place I need to go. So I'm, I'm always kind of hoping that uh, – uh, there's maybe a couple of pitching changes or a couple of home runs to just allow me to get to my next spot because sometimes, um, you know, I get tired, man. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get tired. Yeah. You're, you're still a young guy though. So you got that on your side. <laughs> young at heart. Most certainly I, I can guarantee you that. Yeah. And and yeah. I know you weren't working yesterday and we're recording this on, on Monday the 5th, but I mean, I, I peered up yesterday and I'm like, God, they're giving away Creed three. They're giving away gift cards to underdogs across the street. I'm like, <laughs> I want to be in the stands right now. So I, there, yeah. there's a part of me that wanted to be a part of it as well, but we give away some cool stuff, man. We get uh underdog, like the Creed three. Uh, we give a lot of like, gift cards, underdog, which is right across the street, We're giving away some uh, gift cards at Dockers. And I was kind of like, man, I want a $25 gift card to Dockers. I need some new chinos. I need some new khakis, you know, yeah. I, I, it's not a bad thing. You know, that's the thing. You never know when you come to a ball game, you come to a game, you might see something special. You might catch a foul ball. You might win yourself a, a little prize from the yeah. from the Giants production crew. So you never know. You got to get out to the yard. And if you got a row that you're working with and there's like one empty seat, then maybe that's your chance to take the leftovers. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you, maybe you, you shouldn't comment away. on that publicly. Yeah. You want me to give away a production secret? I mean, if you're allowed to. <laughs> I'll just say we get really lucky. I'll say, I'll say we get really lucky in that uh, in that usually the rows we go to are filled. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Okay. That's fair. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Um, so yeah. I, I saw a tweet the other day. And I, know, <laughs> I know you're the best one to comment on this. Um, and it was comparing, I'm sure you might have seen this too, it was comparing the different California ballparks, right? Uh, and it had the five California ballparks and it was trying to, you know, compare all of them. So of the five California ballparks, I'm going to ask you to rank them from best to worst. I kind of know number one already, obviously. So there's there's your options you have here, are the Coliseum, Oracle Park, Dodger Stadium, Angel Stadium, and Petco Park. Yeah. I Full disclosure, I haven't been to Anaheim and I haven't been to LA. Okay. I haven't been to San Diego. Um, I really, really like Petco. I've been to Petco twice and I really, really liked it. It's in the middle of the gas lamp and it's like a party down there, man. It's so cool that they put the stadium in the middle of a place that's already popping and is already popular. I feel like if you look at other stadiums, um, like Golden One Center up in Sacramento or Oracle Park down here, or even Chase Center, it's, it's they built the stadium or arena first and then built around it. 
And what I liked about Petco is that they already had a neighborhood and they just stuck the stadium in it, which I think is really cool. I love Oracle Park. Nothing to me will ever beat Oracle Park, but man, Petco is really, really, really cool. I love Petco. And I would rank the Coliseum last, but that's just because I really like Petco and I really like Oracle. But the Coliseum is not bad either. You know, I remember they had the shirts a couple of years ago with Last Dive Bar. And, you know, <laughs> I love me a swanky joint, but there's something to me about a darkly lit dive bar you know that's just that's also fun and so as much as people like to give the coliseum some flat the coliseum's cool too man it certainly has its charm and so it's third out of three but that is not because i don't love it because i do love the coliseum but i just really like peco and i really like our oracle but um i've heard not great things about anaheim i heard that angel stadium is kind of just there and I, I know it's old and it doesn't seem like there's a lot going around but oh, going around it going on around it um, and Dodger Stadium is definitely one that I'm I'm shocked I haven't made it to yet. But at some point, I need to go down to a Giants-Dodgers um, game uh, down in L.A. But um, And I don't know if it's Giants bias, but I've heard that Dodger Stadium is also just I. It's, it's just I. So Yeah, it's it's in a parking lot. That's, that's yeah. all we got to say. We'll leave it at that. It, it, it doesn't look like it has any charm. It just seems like it's there. Like the palm trees seem cool. I heard Dodger dogs are terrible. Alex Pavlovich always talks about how disgusting they are. Um, but I definitely want to go just to, I just feels like something as a Giants fan that you have to do almost like a sort of pilgrimage is, is to go to a Giants Dodgers game at Dodger stadium. So that's definitely, uh, on my bucket list somewhere, but I need to get out to one. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in regards to the Coliseum, there's mice at a lot of good dive bars. So, <laughs> oh, oh, Steve, why got doing like is that? that is, is that a, is that a shot right there? That's gotta be a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, had to know. do it had to do yeah, it yeah you, you did you yeah did. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily condone it but you, you did. You <laughs> exactly um yeah different di- kind of random question here are you all in on ballpark proposals where do you stand there i love, I love random questions okay <laughs> all right here's my thing i used to be i used to be anti-ballpark proposal okay i used to be like this is lame this is corny this is why would why would you do this here but you know, being a little older now, you know, and, and having been in love and having been in love and out of love, you know, getting older, I I feel like proposals and weddings for that fact should reflect the relationship of the two people in the relationship. You know what I'm saying? So if you are a person and you are in love with someone and you guys have bonded over Giants baseball and you guys have memories at the stadium and Giants baseball in Oracle Park and going to a game and painting your face and getting Ghirardelli chocolate sundaes and getting a crazy crab sandwich and getting the garlic fries. If all that is a pertinent, important part of your relationship, then why not? You know what I mean? Then then why not? And it happens and they show it on the scoreboard and everyone cheers. And usually the guy is really dorky and anxious and doesn't know what he's doing and he's not looking at the camera and one there was one this season where the guy put it on the wrong hand he put it on the girl's right hand steven when you get engaged when you propose to a woman make sure it goes on the left hand it goes on the left ring finger okay you put it on the wrong hand and we're all watching it in the stands like what are you doing it's the wrong <laughs> hand but you know the proposal should match or should be whatever it is uh, it should be about what that couple is into or, or whatever, uh, you know, whatever that couple's relationships is about. And I'm sure there are a lot of relationships, both romantic and platonic, that revolve around Giants baseball. And I think that's sweet. And, and you know, that's one of my favorite things about sports. I, I love sports. Ever since I was literally six years old, I wanted to work in sports media and sports TV in some capacity. And I feel lucky that I'm getting to live my dream. Yeah, And I would say that one of my favorite things about one of my favorite things about sports is that sports doesn't really matter. You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter, but it makes, it helps the things that do matter. You know, it it helps build relationships with your, our family and our friends and our loved ones. It helps build community. It's, it's an avenue for us to connect with the people and the things that we love. So sports doesn't really matter, but it, it, it helps the things that do matter. And I think if you're into ballpark proposals, man, if you're, if that's Giants baseball is, is what you're related is a big component of your relationship. Why not? I'm not going to poo poo on it. I certainly see what that, I mean, it's corny and, and lame. I'm not going to lie, you know, but love is kind of corny and lame. You know what I mean? 
So it's kind of like that that episode of The Office when Pam proposes to or Jim proposes to Pam in, in the office because that's where they met and they fell in love. You know, if you meet someone and fall in love at Oracle Park, you know, why not? Yeah, that makes total sense. And I do want to tell my future wife, um, first of all, she's out there. Uh, hello. Um, <laughs> she's listening. She's, she's listening, listening Stephen. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. I do want to tell her that do not expect a ballpark proposal from me <laughs> because I'm going to think of something way more original. Okay. Yeah. So, so that that's yeah, my I, official stance. I think that's maybe my my one beef. I think you just hit it, the, the nail on the head. Is that it's not really original. You know, it's been done before. Maybe if you can put a little wrinkle on it. But also, you can't. It's going to be hard to propose from the press box, Stephen. Yeah, it's gonna that's be true. Hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard. You might you might catch some side eyes, man. You, some of the beat writers might look at you a little weird if you you know during a <laughs> Casey Schmidt at bat, you would get on one knee and propose to your lady. Yeah. It, it, it's going to be it's going to be very strange for you to propose at the rooftop of the NBC Sports Bay Area Studios. <laughs> exactly. Well, at least then I would have a view, you know. Yeah, that's true. Like, the view is nice yeah. weather, but it's hard to beat the views in the weather at Oracle Park too. So. You're going to have Cole in the corner chowing down on like a burger or something, <laughs> looking at you, looking at you like, what is this guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, ballpark proposals definitely a controversial subject i'm glad that we could yeah kind of, i don't kind of cap i don't on hate that. it you know, i don't hate it it's you know mm -hmm. love yeah. is love but yeah. i like what you said about bringing people together and yeah, you know absolutely. the brief conversations that i've had with you are memorable because of your enthusiasm and i'm sure the listeners are getting a chance to see it firsthand here it seems like you you really never really leave your enthusiasm if that makes sense like i can't imagine yeah. you having a bad day where does the oh. positive and fun energy come from with you um, I just, life's too short, man. Life's too short to have a bad day. And I have bad days. I think everyone has bad days. There are times when I, I feel like we have bad shows or there are times at the stadium when I feel like I do a bad hit or I stumble over a word or I say the wrong thing, or I had a joke or something online that I wanted to say. And then you just get in the heat of the moment and it just slips your mind. But I think for me, man, it, it, it just, life is, is too short to just dwell on the negative and I do my best to um to try to stay positive and try to stay upbeat and try to be happy i love to see people laugh i love laughing i love people man i love that's why i, I love doing my job that's why i love being at oracle park because i get to say hi to people and you know before my hits i'm riling the people up behind me i'm telling them to make noise and i'm telling them when to be on tv but life's too short man i think that's really what it is and i think i, I i'm glad that that comes across you know that's definitely who i want to be and what i want to project but um, and also, I think just when you work in in the industry of of sports entertainment, sports media, and you have a TV show, and you know you need to be positive. You know, you need to be upbeat. You want you want to you want that to be infectious. And you know, I think especially at the ballpark when we're I don't want to say a mascot, but we're kind of like an avatar of the fan. You know, and you want the fans to be upbeat. You want them to be excited about the team. You want them to be excited when they score a run and when they're winning. Um, so that just kind of flows. Um, that kind of flows naturally to me, but, um, but also there's a challenge in, in doing it in a way that's not off-putting and doing it in a way that's, um, original and is genuine to, to who I am, you know, cause there are some people I see on, on TV, on other networks where you kind of see them and you're like, are they like that, you know, or are they putting it on or is it a front? And so I hope that the way that I come off on camera, um, is genuine and is, is genuine to me and natural to me. I think that's what I try to do is, is stay true to myself. And, um, I just feel like, you know, a, something that I bring to the show and bring to the, the ballpark is, is my own originality and my own mm -hmm. self. And I, you know, I, no one can beat me better than, than me, you know, so just kind of being that. And I think so far it's working. I'm not mm -hmm. really sure. But uh, I appreciate you saying that because um, I've always wanted to come off as as fun and energetic and outgoing. And I think that's um, that's what I'm doing. And I just hope that people know that when they see me, it is absolutely authentic and genuine. That is 100 percent who I am. Well, hopefully I didn't jinx you and you don't have a bad day today because that would be pretty <laughs> that'd be, that'd be pretty rough. But um, you're, you're yeah, laughing. You're yeah, man, I'm going to. Yeah, when a pigeon poops on me on my way to work today, I'm going to be like, Stephen, this was all your fault. I'll accept it. I'll accept yeah. it for sure. Uh, and I know tacos instead of uh, pork tacos later, it's going to be your fault. <laughs> exactly. And then you'll end your, end your day with a proposal of some sort. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I know you grew up a Giants fan, obviously, big, yeah. big Giants guy growing up. 
And I also know that you're a very staunch supporter of Barry Lamar Bonds. And I, I remember oh. this hit that you did on your, your uh, WebEx Cisco thing. Uh, yes. And you were a very staunch supporter of Barry Bonds' Hall of Fame case. Yes, uh, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It's, no, it's I agree with you. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I it's, agree with you. And and, yeah. and and you're probably very excited for this new HBO show coming up that is kind of in the in the makings. Man, I almost don't know if I want to look behind the curtain. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know how much information I want. Like, I'm excited about it. I'm glad that he's going to be able to tell his story. I, you know, my, my thing with the Barry Bonds thing is that um, at the end of the day, the Hall of Fame is a museum, right? I agree. And sports writers and the people that vote, they they don't get to be arbiters of morality. You know, they don't get to be the moral morality police. Um, you know, there's a lot of other people who have done a lot of bad things who are in that Hall of Fame. And it's the history of baseball. And it's uh, the, the, um, the analogy I give is it, it's like going to the Museum of Natural History and T Rex statue was in there. You know what I mean? It's there's mm-hmm. some things you need in a museum, and you cannot tell the story of baseball, the history of baseball, without the guy who is one of, if not the greatest baseball player of all time, the guy who holds the single season home run record, the guy who holds the all time career home run record, which are probably two of the sexiest records in all, all of sports two hits home runs in a season and in a career. And it's him. He's one of the most MVPs. Um, it's, even if he wasn't a San Francisco Giant, even if he was a childhood hero, I would still I think it's ridiculous that he's not in. I think it's ridiculous that Pete Rose isn't in. I think it's ridiculous that Roger Clemens and even someone like Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire, these guys who had such an impact on the sport of baseball, no matter what happened or what era that they played in, I mean, they were the face of baseball. Um, and it's just absolutely preposterous that these guys aren't celebrated and then these guys aren't in the Hall of Fame. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I'll tell another story. Um, Terrell Owens, they, they had, there was a, a show in Caesar's Palace. I forget the name of it. It was called like Rule Breakers or Game Changers. And it was mm-hmm. these three controversial athletes. It was Terrell Owens, it was Jose Canseco, and it was um, Jim McMahon. Um, the old Chicago Bears quarterback and Tara Owens was there and people were asking and they basically did like a one-man show like it was like three one-man shows and kind of one show and Tara Owens who was a controversial wide receiver um, said something I never forgot and he made the Pro Football Hall of Fame on his third ballot and he said I feel like I got a third place trophy when I know I deserve a first so even the fact that even if and when Barry Bonds gets in it's still a crock. You know, he should have got in in first on his first ballot. He should have gotten in a hundred percent. And I've heard Barry in interviews say that the hall of fame doesn't matter to him. And uh, I hope he's telling the truth. And if that's how he feels, that's how it feels. But you know what, Barry, it matters to me. It matters to me, Barry. And uh, maybe not a hall of famer in the actual hall of fame, but he's in the Anthony Garcia's heart hall of fame. And I think that um, I hope that matters to him. I hope I get a first place trophy in that Hall of Fame. That's all I care about. Um, Not if you jinx my day, you might be. Yeah, exactly. Out dang, yeah, we'll dang. And and I hope that if Barry does get in, he does pull a Terrell Owens, and he 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 doesn't do his speech in Cooperstown. Have it at Oracle Park, you know. I don't think Cooperstown deserves yeah. to have your speech there. So. Yeah, I know when they when they did the Barry Bonds Day a couple years ago. I know a lot of people kind of treated that as if it was his Hall of Fame speech. Mm-hmm. And I remember Willie Mays was there and. Like, dignitaries came by and Barry gave a really long speech and people gave really long speeches for Barry. Um, but you know, it's funny. It's, it's kind of like, he's not in, but at the same time, we all saw his career. You know, we saw what happened. We, we, we know what he did. We, we know how good he was and, and what he deserves and, and what he should be. But um, I'm excited about the documentary. I'm probably going to watch the documentary, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't, you know, it's kind of like peeking behind the curtain of wizard of Oz. Like, do I really want to see there? Or yeah. Do I want to, just kind of have this this image uh but um um it obviously i don't think he would have signed off if he didn't want to tell a story so i'm excited that uh he's going to be able to tell a story and i know it's the same producers of the last dance and um i think they produced something else as well the jeter um, one yeah and the last dance was was really really good did you see the Derek jeter one i did i did watch was it, it good it was good, but it's almost like anything was it? after it, it was. So it's almost like anything after the last dance is kind of like they're trying to do the last dance, but they yeah. can't right they can't exactly get it. So yeah. 
the whole time I was watching it, I was thinking like they're trying to be the last dance. They're trying yeah. to be the last dance. And like well, Jeter, Jeter is that figure that you could do something like that about, but um, I, there just I, wasn't any like drama really. I'm, I'm a little older than you. And I remember living through the Derek Jeter days and he, he got a lot of hits. He played for the Yankees. He won some world series and he dated supermodels. You know, it was just kind of like, what, where is the, where's the story? What's the, I just feel, I feel like I got it the, when he played. I didn't think I needed a eight mm. part documentary of Derek Jeter dating a Miss Universe and Derek Jeter getting hit number 3000 and Derek Jeter winning world series number four. It just, to me, I, I didn't care about it, but I'm not a Yankee fan. And I was just like, is this going to, I feel like I got mm. it the first time around. Um, it's kind of like how they keep remaking these Spider-Mans. Yeah. <laughs> he gets bit by a radioactive spider and Uncle Ben dies and he lives with his aunt. How many times yeah. do we keep telling the story? So um, but I I hope they got into the A Rod stuff because that's they really did. Cool. They yeah, did. That's yeah. the only thing I would want to know that I don't know about it. So but uh yeah, this Barry Bonds thing I feel like is gonna have a lot more layers, and I think everyone's gonna be interested in the PED stuff. And I hope um, Jeff Kent takes part in it. That would be awesome. I would I would love that. <laughs> I would love, yeah. I don't know if Jeff's gonna say nice things, but I would like to get to the bottom of that Barry Bonds Jeff Kent thing because that was really interesting and really weird that they um that you know they had that altercation in san diego um but yeah yeah no it, it's yeah definitely the they did touch on the a raw jeter stuff and the jeter one but the cool thing about the last dance is that it was jordan it was a lot of jordan but it was also the bulls right yeah. steve kerr had a bit in it and dennis rodman and yeah. and you know all these other players in it and it's it was fun to hear about yeah. them so yeah, yeah. um and and we'll see what, how they do with this Barry Bonds one. Um, well, uh, we're almost wrapping up here, but I do want to get into Summer Sunday because yeah. that's kind of your uh, your your gig. It's season three now of Summer Sunday. Season and, three, man. Yeah, yeah. For those, yeah for... that's what I, I mentioned White Lotus only has two seasons, <laughs> uh, so we're at least one season better than White Lotus. Uh, yes, that, and that, you, you're so. gonna tie Ted Lasso by the end of this. Yeah, so. exactly. Ted Lasso only has three. Uh, Summer Sunday now on season three, and hopefully counting. So we're at least as good as Ted Lasso, if not better. Yes. For 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 those that don't know, do you want to kind of describe Summer Sunday, what the vibe of it is? It's uh, Krook and Kipe have referred to us as the four knuckleheads, which I think is a probably the best, most apt way to describe us. It's me. It's Carmen Q. It's Therese Vignon. It's Cole Kuyper. It's the four of us. It's an offshoot of uh, our old show, Triples Alley, which we did in 2019. Um, and it's just having fun, man. We, um, we're fans, you know, we're not former players. We never played in the majors. Um, and it's just kind of, what are the fans talking about? For the lack of a better term, we are the voice and the faces of the San Francisco Giants fans and fan base. And I feel bad because we were not elected. We, <laughs> we were just kind of appointed. So I apologize that we are the voices and the, and the faces, but it's just kind of like, you know, my, I guess my mission statement for the show is if you're, hanging with your friends in your living room or at a sports bar having just watched the game what would you guys be talking about you know and i think those are the things that we try to talk about we don't pretend to know our x's and o's none of us played in in the majors none of us played in the minors i i stopped playing i got cut from the jv team at, at reardon because i couldn't hit a curveball you know so uh but we're very knowledgeable we've all been friend, uh, fan, fans since childhood we love the team you know we we uh bleed orange and black and we we just love the team we've been fans for our whole lives and so um you know exactly just what would the fans be talking about we talk about you know possible trades possible trade targets um we talk about how how the guys are doing well we do a lot of interviews like we just sat down with mike yastrzemski yesterday and we you know we have fun interviews with the players i think everyone knows the jersey numbers everyone knows the stats but i think another thing we try to do is is who are who is the person behind the jersey who is the person underneath the helmet and the hat? And what are what are um, some interesting facts, some interesting stories off the field? You know, get to know them as people. Um, so that's something that we try to do too. But yeah, man, it's just a, a show for the fans, by the fans, because at the end of the day, we're all fans. And, you know, we we have a lot of fun. Um, our bosses like it. I, I think the fans like it. They brought us back season of three seasons. We get nothing but positive feedback. You know, we do the home games. We do the show at Oracle Park. And, you know, we walk through and people say what's up and say they love the show and give us high fives and hand pounds. And so I think we're doing a good job. It's something that we're all really, really, really proud of. Um, and we have a good time, man. And I think if, if anyone who hasn't seen the show, I think if you'll watch the show, you'll see that we have a good time. 
And uh, I think you'll have a good time too. And, and also, honestly, and one of my favorite things that people say to us is that they go, oh, the four of you guys are like friends. And we are friends. We are mm-hmm. legitimately friends. I got COVID last season and they all sent me um, some things. And, you know, it was um, Carmen invites us over to her house for her birthday and for her dog's birthday. And, you know, I've been to Cole's house. And, when you, you had know, COVID? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> it got me. It got me, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, you know, we are four legitimate friends. We have, we're like these weird siblings, you know, we're this weird family. And so we I think it comes off on screen. And, you know, the story analogy I like to use is, you know, when you watch Saturday Night Live and, and the best sketches are the ones where they're cracking each other up and you can tell that they're having fun. And I think that's what our show is. I think anyone who watches the show, you can tell that we're having fun, that we have great relationships with each other and that we love the Giants, that we're hardcore Giants fans. Um, so, you know, we try to stay away from the X's and O's and, you know, what someone's count, what pitch they should throw when it's two and two against the player whose last name ends in a vowel on a 33 day in April. You know, that's not us. That's not our show, you know, and, and we understand. You no. Know, so we're just coming at it uh, from a different angle. You know, we're, we're, we're fans. So we talk about it as fans and um, we have a lot of fun, man, because that's what being a fan is all about, I feel like. Yeah. And, and you guys do a really good job, really good energy. And I, you I are appreciate. you are bordering up. I think by the end of season three, you're like on track to be at the point where you don't have to pay for a meal in San Francisco. No, <laughs> no, hardly, <laughs> hardly. Um, hey, hey, next no. Sunday, next Sunday, I expect a full like breakdown from you of starting pitchers who have good changeups on day games during the month of June. <laughs> <laughs> I expect I'll give it. my rankings. Yeah, best changeups on a six. 65 degree day when they're wearing their road grace. You yes. You'll get that from me. Top yes. Five. I'm sure that'll drive up the rating. Yeah, yeah. And only on broadcast where Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk has three commercials. <laughs> so that is much needed. I love those commercials, man. I love those commercials. Yeah. Hey, in the warm California sun. You know what I'm saying? Oh, boardwalk. <laughs> yeah, man. Who doesn't? Yeah. Um, so some current giant stuff just to wrap up real quick uh we we saw splash hit 100 that was a big deal i know for you guys it was a big deal you guys were trying to predict it uh who would hit it carmen got it right Um, carmen got it right so did you who who did you have hitting it i had craw just because i thought it would be romantic i'm a hopeless romantic Stephen. i'm telling you this yeah i thought it would be fitting i thought it would be apropos if the longest tenured giant, if someone who grew up in the Bay as a Giants fan hit number 100. So that's, I was going for the story, you know, um, but I took Brandon Crawford, but it, it, Carmen, we do predictions every now and again, and Carmen gets a lot right. She mm-hmm. gets a lot right. I don't, someone needs to ask her what the lot of numbers are going to be. Someone needs to take her to Vegas with them. Uh, but Carmen gets a lot right. But Carmen said Lamont Way Jr. And it was Lamont Way Jr. And we, we, you know, to the victory goes the spoils. We, you know, we gave Carmen her time to gloat and she did a literal lap. We gave her a lap, so to speak, and she took a literal lap um, on the set. So, um, you know, we we talk a lot of mess. We have a lot of fun, but we also give props where credit is due to the team and also to each other. Yep. And I'm I'm 21 years old, Anthony, and I'm still old enough to remember Carmen's GIF stage on Twitter where she used to come out with the great GIFs or yeah, GIFs or whatever. That's how she rose to fame, man. She has become the the crown princess of Giants Twitter, and it was through gifts. And you know what? I'm, I'm she's probably going to be really embarrassed that I tell the story, which makes me want to tell it even more. We were walking yesterday through Oracle Park, and some guy stopped her. Carmen gets stopped a lot. She's uh-huh. like the mayor of Oracle Park. She got stopped, and one of the fans was like, "Oh my god, I follow you on Twitter. I've been following you for for years." And Carmen, who gets can get really bashful and really shy, was like blushing. And I was giving her, uh, you know, I was giving her some flack afterwards. But um, yeah, Carmen Q, man, does people remember? People don't forget. I like they say, no. it's super bad. People don't forget, man. Yeah, so it's not you forget. that's not going to be paying for any meal in San Francisco. It's going to be it's going to be Carmen, man. <laughs> be, yeah, if, if anyone is going to be getting free meals, it's going to be Carmen. But Carmen is very generous and nice. So when they buy her garlic fries, I will. She will certainly offer me one or two, and I will certainly take probably three or four. She's going to accidentally like when you're not working or when you guys aren't working. She's going to accidentally end up in one of those rows where that gets the free underdogs, <laughs> <the> underdogs coupon. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gonna be Maybe. by chance. Uh, look, I'm just saying, for a fee, if you text me, I I might be able to tell some people maybe where to sit, what sections <laughs> of what rows where to sit. 
if you want a little doctor's gift card or if you want a copy of a the Dungeon and Dragons movie, you know, oh, maybe yeah. I can help you out. Interesting. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, and by the, just to wrap up, one more thing. I, I know you're pr- probably very enthusiastic with the Giants' young core that they have, or oh, that they've yeah. brought up with Schmidt and Bailey, and they have a ton of rookies that are kind of feeding off of each other and experiencing, uh, yeah. experiencing uh, coming up to the big leagues together. So, what have you kind of seen from from some of those guys? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny because I feel like the the scuttlebutt or kind of the the news around those guys is that they were better defensively than they were better offensively, yeah. especially. Patrick Bailey, who wasn't really hitting well in, in the minors, and then he comes up. He's got a home run from both sides of the plate. He's hitting over 300. Casey Schmidt hit a home run in his very first game. Um, and the defense from Schmidt has been amazing. I mentioned it yesterday on the show. You know, you, every now and again, there's a tweet about stat cast records of fastest throw from an in, infielder to first base. And like Casey Schmidt's got like four of the top five or something like that. So, you know, I just feel like especially after 2021 last year was literally felt like a ho-hum season and it was literally a 500 season. And then this year, I think one of the things I was looking at was, okay, is this the 20 in 2023 or are, are they the 2021 team still, or, or are they the 500 team from 2022? And I still think we don't have that answer yet, but I'll tell you what, when you get an injection of, of youth and excitement, like you've gotten from Casey Schmidt, like you've gotten from Patrick Bailey, um, You've got Kyle Harrison waiting in the wings, who's who's striking everybody out in AAA. And we talked about Luis Matos yesterday on Summer Sunday, an outfielder in AAA, who's the Giants' number seven prospect. He's the number 30 prospect in all of baseball and baseball prospectus. That he got promoted on May 16, and he's hitting 400. He's hitting 400. He's got an OPS over 1,000. So it's not just Schmidt and Bailey. It's, it's guys that they have waiting in the wings in AAA. And, and I think as a fan, yeah, it would have been nice to get Aaron Judge and it would have been nice to get in Carlos Correa and, and, you know, Carlos Rodon, another free agent, but it just, it's feels, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels more rewarding when they're guys that come up through your system. It feels more rewarding when you hear their names for a long time in the minors and they debut and, and they spend their career as giants, you know, as, as great as some of the giants of the past have been. I mean, there's a reason why Tim Lincecum and Brandon Crawford and Brandon Belt and Buster Posey, like there's a reason why those guys mean so much to Giants fans. It's because they spent their entire career here or most of their career here and they came up through the system. And we remember things like Brandon Crawford hitting a grand slam in his first game against the Brewers. And we remember Buster Posey's rookie of the year in 2010. You know, when it's guys that you can literally see grow before your own eyes. I mean, it just means that much more as a fan. And it's nice that the Giants have this, are starting to build this young core. So even if, you know, they don't make the playoffs this season, we know in 2024 and beyond, hey, there's a there's a young core here that kind of reminds us of the Posey, Bumgarner, or Lincecum, Kane years, and, and there may be a window uh, in the future. I mean, that's really exciting. 100%. Uh, Anthony, dude, this was awesome. We had a lot of fun. And uh, congrats on Summer Sunday, all the success with you, you in your career. And... Uh... Congrats on season three, too. And I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate being on. Thank you for the invite. Episode 140, which means, Stephen, I look forward to being back on episode 280. Good math. God, I couldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. And everybody, if you want to be bold enough and you, and you want to be uh, very brave enough to give Anthony a follow on Twitter, Go ahead. His his at is at Sports Anthony. I don't know how he got that handle. That's pretty impressive because that seems like a very generic handle. But he ended up getting me either. I have no <laughs> idea. How it's Anthony. <laughs> oh, I love that. But uh... I've always wanted to do this. Can I, can, I, can I get my plugs in? I've always wanted. I hear this on podcasts. Plug like, yourself oh, away. You got all the time in the world. Here we go on Twitter and on and on Instagram at Sports Anthony. You can watch Summer Sunday. 30 minutes before and immediately after every Giants game all summer long on Sundays. We're going all the way to Labor Day. And you can catch me as the Giants in-game host at Oracle Park. I've always wanted to do that, Stephen. That was fun. Well, I'm glad that I could give you the opportunity. That was awesome. <laughs> I, I don't have to do anything now. I can plug myself. You guys can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast. And then I am on Twitter at Stephen Rizzotto. Go check that out. And then you can find the podcast wherever you find your podcast. That's another one. That's another fun thing to, uh, to say. Wherever you get, where all podcasts are available. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go check it out. And um, more stuff to come soon. And see you next time.